It's my pleasure while Edmund's getting wired up to um, introduce him. I think you've heard him over the course of several days. He pops off about lots of different things because I think he has a really profound experience in thinking about um, neurons, what they do. Um, he thinks about monkeys, he thinks about people, he thinks about reward, he thinks about pleasure. And I think he has a really deep view of how these systems work. He has a modest preoccupation with the orbital frontal cortex, if I must say. But I think um, his view on thinking about emotions preceded much of affective neuroscience as it's currently described. And um, I'm looking forward to what he's going to say, which is called On the Rules of Cortical Wiring and Function with Implications for Understanding Psychiatric Disease. Edmund Ross. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> The people who took part in the sort of work I'm going to be talking about today include Fabian Gravenhorst, Simon Stringer, and Gustavo Deco. Um, I've got an ambitious aim today. I want to try to understand, to some extent, what the fundamental rules are of cortical wiring. Um, therefore, what is being specified by genes um, to build the cortex and th that has implications for understanding some neuropsychiatric <laughs> disorders, okay? So um, <clears throat> that's my main aim. I'm going to call on evidence from neurophysiology and primates, human fMRI, and computational neuroscience, which I always try to combine in my research as much as possible on memory, vision, emotion, and decision-making systems in the brain. Um, I'm gonna start off just with a few pathways. Um, so that I'm putting in some empirical research. So we've done many studies of vision and taste and olfaction, which show that up to this stage of processing, you know nothing about reward in what's represented. All you know about is what the object is, what the taste is, independently of how nice it is, um, <clears throat> what the visual stimulus is to infrotemporal cortex. The rule is that then you go on from this tier to another tier, um, tier two, orbitofrontal cortex and amygdala, where one puts together information from these different what streams and you compute reward. Now you can do that because you have primary reinforcers going in there. You have taste, for example, which is a primary reinforcer. That means it's a gene-specified innate reward. And similarly, touch gets into orbitofrontal cortex and that's a primary reward. Visual stimuli are generally not. So you do emotion and emotion-related learning in this stream, and notice that that includes, from orbitofrontal cortex, a big projection up to pregenual cingulate. Now, from pregenual cingulate and the rest of cingulate, there's one output of these reward or value systems for action outcome learning. Another output to influence behavior is by the direct projections down to the stratum, uh, mainly for habit learning. Um, the bit we're working on at the moment is particularly a decision-making system in medial prefrontal cortex area 10. Um, the summary is that cingular cortex carries a linear value representation. It tells you exactly how nice something is, but if you have to compare two things, you then need to take a binary choice and it looks as if that goes on in medial prefrontal cortex area 10. So that's an overall bit of architecture of this system, and because, um, as Helen said, I'm very interested in it, I'm going to just, for the first one or two slides, show you a bit about this. Now this slide lets me show you pregenual cingulate cortex. Uh, that's where almost every reward that you receive produces activation. Um, as it does in orbitofrontal cortex down here, which then projects up there. The new bit of cortex we're interested in at the moment is medial area 10 here, just in front of it, which is the bit that we think does binary choices between reward stimuli. So it's not a behavior output or action choice system. Um, <clears throat> which I'll just go back to that. So, um, Helen, I think, will be talking tomorrow about a bit of cortex that's behind this, and I wanted to point that out. So the subcolosal area involved in depression is probably about here, where I have the pointer. Uh, rewards, then, are represented um, slightly above that. 
Now, I want to show you a little bit more about this reward system. And I'm going to use an experiment in which we were delivering tastes into the mouth at time zero in an fMRI experiment. But at the same time as we delivered a taste, we said, pay attention to how nice it is, give it a pleasantness rating at the end of the trial, or pay attention to how intense the taste is. So that was the fMRI experiment. But here's the result. So this is a contrast of when you're rating pleasantness versus when you're rating intensity. Okay? So this whole swathe of territory from pregenual cingulate cortex down to orbitofrontal cortex, this sort of region, is then representing reward value. And you can see that because if I show you the pleasantness ratings here for the stimuli, which were being modulated by attention, and the bold signal extracted from medial orbitofrontal cortex or pregenual, you see that your subjective pleasantness is linearly related to the bold signal in those regions. So that underlines the fact that those regions, orbitofrontal cortex, which projects into anterior cingulate, uh, encoding reward value. Now, the result of that particular experiment on paying attention is you turn up the gain in one whole system, which involves pregenual cingulate and orbitofrontal cortex, as determined by functional connectivity correlations. And that's correlated with a part of dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which seems to be the attentional controller. Um, there's then a different system, taste cortex and mid-insula. Uh, that whole processing stream is biased by a slightly more posterior bit of dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. The interest of this is that your connectivity, your brain connectivity, is being modulated by a top-down attentional signal, which has an origin in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And so this leads to a biased activation theory of attention, whereby you turn on whole processing streams by these top-down short-term memories that say, for this trial, pay attention to pleasantness, or for this trial, pay attention to intensity. So the brain itself is being affected. The connectivity, the whole functional connectivity that you measure in this stream is affected by the top-down attentional bias. Now, if I put together all of the pleasantness activations in yellow and all of the unpleasantness activations in white in this medial view of the brain, we see that pregenual cingulate cortex here is activated by a very large number of rewards, which are shown here. This is a review in ticks. Um, <clears throat> whereas unpleasant stimuli, unpleasant tastes, for example, pain and so on, activate more dorsally above the corpus callosum. Um, similarly, for the orbitofrontal cortex, there's a map. Um, pleasant stimuli yellow tend to activate medial, and lateral, one gets unpleasant stimuli. And this is related to one of the preceding talks I've done. Um, <clears throat> impulsiveness, uh, we believe, is influenced by this lateral bit of prefrontal cortex, which responds to non-reward and tells you, effectively, if you receive a punisher, then stop doing something. And some people are not sensitive to punishers and hence are impulsive. And this, of course, has major projections into the ventral striatum. The reason I wanted to put this up today is, again, because of Helen's talk tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> when she stimulates with deep brain stimulation and when others do, I think they're stimulating about here, but we'll see a bit more tomorrow. Um, it's inevitable that they will be activating, therefore, fiber pathways, which almost certainly have connections to this bit of pregenual cingulate as well as to orbitofrontal cortex coming back down here. So I think one of the reasons that deep brain stimulation works for depression is that it's activating our positive reward value system here in pregenual cingulate and also in medial orbitofrontal cortex. Okay? So that's just to relate to other talks in this meeting. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not going to say more about emotion because the day before I left to come here, I just finished this book, which will be out at Society for Neuroscience this year. 
which is a book about emotion and decision making. Instead, I'm going to go on now to do the difficult job, which is to talk about what I think the rules are of cortical wiring. Um, <clears throat> so let's get into that. I want to make sure that everyone has some idea of what cortical architecture does. Um, it's dominated by local recurrent collateral connections. These are pyramidal cells, the cell bodies and the dendrites. And you have short-range local recurrent collateral connections, which are excitatory. Now, say you modify some of these synapses associatively, these four, say, then those two neurons, but of course hundreds in the real brain, would tend to become a self-exciting coalition. In other words, if you start them firing, they'll continue firing for a long term, a long time. And that's how short-term memory, we think, is implemented in the cerebral cortex, in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, for example. But this same circuitry can be used for long-term memory in the same sort of way. I can use some of these neurons to store one memory and other neurons to store another one. And that's what happens in the hippocampus. But it turns out that the same fundamental cortical circuitry Local recurrent collaterals um, <clears throat> can also be used for decision making. If I just put in a bias, lambda 1, to this pair of neurons, and simultaneously the other decision variable, lambda 2, to this pair, then they're going to fight it out through inhibitory interneurons, which are not shown here. And the positive feedback will make this set of neurons try to win, and the positive feedback would make this set of neurons try to win. And so, if lambda 1 is a bit bigger than lambda 2, this population will win. But it turns out that whether it does is influenced by the spiking time of the neurons, which are noise in the system. So the reason that your decision-making is probabilistic is in part due to the internal noise, due to the random spiking times of these neurons for a given mean rate. So the point here simply is the same fundamental cortical architecture is a model of short-term memory, of decision-making, and of long-term memory, and it's used all over again. If anyone wants to read more about this, we wrote a book on this called The Noisy Brain, and we argue that the stochasticity in this system, the noise, is terribly important. Uh, just think of yourself trying to come up with a new idea for an experiment every day. If you were deterministic, you would never get a new idea. The idea is that the noisiness in this decision-making or memory retrieval circuit makes you have slightly different ideas each day. And that's a very important part of creativity, we think. And that's just one of about a dozen advantages of this sort of noisy architecture. I want to give you some sort of idea of how we can actually study this system quantitatively. So we make dynamical models of it in which we use integrate and fire neurons. And they charge up until they reach a threshold here, and then they give a spike. These neurons have dynamically modeled synapses here so that they have the correct, for example, NMDA receptor time constant, and AMPA receptor time constant, and GABA time constant, and then we study populations of neurons, which, for example, are doing short-term memory, short-term memory one and short-term memory two, um, or might be doing decision-making. Now, this is still giving you an idea of what attractor networks do. So here is an example of an attractor network doing short-term memory. So we have two seconds of firing of two populations of neurons, before any stimulus is applied. And this is the firing rate in spikes a second. If we apply a small input to one of our populations, decision one, the blue one, then it creeps up. But the interesting thing is it stays up, even when you remove the input stimuli. So that's how short-term memory is implemented. And I just want to make it clear that in the simulations, we have all of the neurons, each row here, is an example of a single neuron. And there are hundreds of neurons in each of these populations. And we can see them spiking away, which are the little spikes here, until the system takes its decision about there. 
Now, I'll be returning to that model when I talk about schizophrenia a little bit later. However, the next thing I want to do is to start to compare networks in different cortical areas to try to understand how they're different from each other, to try to understand what the genes must be specifying. And really what I'm interested here is in how individual networks in the cortex operate. Um, <clears throat> so let's look at the cerebellum. Um, the interesting thing is there's a single climbing fiber coming up to a single Purkinje cell. Um, yet there are about 86,000 parallel fibers here which cross the Purkinje cell dendrite. So the numbers seem to be telling us something. Uh, here are the numbers set out just a little bit more precisely. Single Purkinje cell has basically about 86,000 synapses on it, which have their origin from about 191 mossy fibers. So what one does is expansion recoding here onto the granule cells of this input, and then you uh, provide the inputs to a single neuron, whereas the other input to this neuron, what we think is the teacher, is just one climbing fiber. So the idea here is someone has to specify these numbers for genes. Okay? So that's cerebellum. That's just an example of numbers. Now let's turn to the hippocampus. So here we have the perforant path coming in um, to the dentate granule cells, mossy fibers coming to CA3, a highly developed recurrent collateral system, which you see here, and then the Schaefer collateral coming out to CA1. Now again, the numbers here turn out to be very important in the architecture. This is a single CA3 cell. Its axon happens to go all the way to one end of CA3 and all the way to the other end of CA3. And it also does that in every plane, in the other plane. So a single CA3 neuron can potentially connect to any other CA3 neuron. Here we have a single network in the brain. And this is a complete contrast to neocortex, as you'll see in a minute. Now let's follow through these numbers in a bit more detail. So here we are, rat hippocampus. Pyramidal cells here, there are about 300,000 of them. But each pyramidal cell has about 12,000 recurrent collateral inputs. But it has a tiny number, 46, of mossy fiber inputs then it has about 3,600 direct perforant path inputs coming in from interlinal cortex. So you, do you see, again, the numbers seem to be telling us something. And I want to tell you today what we think the numbers are telling us, um, and, but to argue that genes must be specifying things like the numbers of inputs that mossy fibers make onto an individual pyramidal cell. So, in the cerebellum, hippocampus, and neocortex, the number of synapses onto each neuron appears to be being specified. The next question is, why? Well, here, I think, is a large part of the answer. So this is theoretical work that we did on the hippocampus. And we wanted to calculate the number of different long-term memories that you could store in the hippocampal auto-association network, attractor network. It turns out that the number of patterns you can store is linearly related to C. Ignore the RC, that just means they're recurrent collaterals. So it's the number of connections on any one single neuron that determines how many memories you can store in one of these networks. This is actually the sparseness of the representation A, which is less than one. The sparser the representation, the lower A is. So one advantage of having sparse representations is that you can store more memories. Okay, so now if we consider this number C and go back and have a look at our um, CA3 network with 12,000 recurrent collaterals, given the sparseness of the representation, 
we believe that the rat hippocampus could store 12,000 separate episodic memories. Okay? Now, let's consider a single neuron in your neocortex. That's got about 18,000 inputs, probably 9,000 of them are these recurrent collaterals. The implication of that is that in one little cortical column, now of neocortex, you could store about 10,000 items. And that's a person's typical vocabulary. So we're talking about a bit of cortex that's two millimeters across. Okay? So now we have some understanding that this number does mean something. It's very important to have it large in many parts of the brain. And it has to be specified then genetically that that should be large, but that some other numbers need to be smaller. So why then have this number of only 46? So the idea is, and I've covered this, that the 46 or 48 inputs are to provide pattern separation. They're to drive an arbitrary new collection of CA3 cells whenever you present a new input to the circuit. Now, this is um, a detailed theory that we worked out some time ago. But the idea is, if you activate a random set of these mossy fibers, because there are so few connections onto the pyramidal cells, whenever you activate a separate, a different set of these mossy fibers, the pyramidal cells you pick out are going to be a new random subset. So it's a mathematical theory that we produced which explains why these inputs are so sparse. So there's a rich theory now for that number. Now what about this number, 3,600? Well, it turns out that this input from outside to the hippocampus doesn't have enough neurons in it to start recalls. So you must have another input. And that's what we think that 3,600 does. So what I've tried to do is to give you some insight into how when you start to understand single networks in the cortex, you, um, ha you come up with ideas for what has to be specified. But the rich thing is, why? Now I want to ask another question. Now I don't think this has ever been answered. Why is connectivity in the cerebral cortex diluted? Why is it that we don't have any one pyramidal cell making exactly one connection to another pyramidal cell? It's a fundamental property of all neocortex and of the hippocampus. So in the hippocampus, the probability of connecting to another nearby neuron is about 0.04. In the neocortex, in a cortical column, it's about 0.1. So what's going on here? Well, the hypothesis is that if excitatory neurons made connections to neurons in the same class, for example, CA3, or nearby in the cortex at random, and there was, on average, one connection between every pair of neurons, then some neurons would have two or more connections. So this is a Poisson distribution. Okay? If you set the average to be one, some will have more. Now, what would be the implications of some neurons having, say, two connections? Well, here's just the, a Poisson table. If you set lambda equal to one, on average, one connection, to every other neuron, then a lot of your neurons will have two, and quite a number will still have three. But if you set your connectivity down to a low value, to say 0.1 or 0.04 as for the hippocampus, then the number of pairs of neurons that have two connections between them, when selected at random, is very low. So having a low probability of connecting means that you very rarely have double connections. Now, what would be the advantage of that, of not having double connections? So again, there's a rich theory here. If you have an auto-association or attractor network, 
then if two of your neurons have, say, two or three connections, it means that you're more likely to retrieve that memory. It's got a stronger attractor basin, as we describe it. The consequence is that the storage capacity of the whole system would go right down. And that's actually what this simulation here shows. So this is a simulation of an attractor network. And this is how many memories we load. This is full loading up to the equivalent of 12,000 memories in the hippocampus. And what we see is that the retrieval, which can be as good as one, works very well, provided we use diluted connectivity to point one. But as soon as we use um, non-diluted connectivity, and so we have double and triple synapses, then instead of staying up close to one, as we increase the loading, the number of memories in the net, the performance drops off drastically. So that's a computer simulation of a formal attractor network to say that's correct. Double synapses or triple synapses can be very dangerous in terms of memory capacity. And so again, that's a fundamental solution. There clearly aren't enough genes to specify the connections between every pair of neurons in the brain. So the argument is it has to be considerably at random who connects to who. And therefore, to make sure you don't have any double or triple connections in, for example, a hippocampal cortex, you set the average probability to be low. Again, it's a fundamental idea about brain design. So that's the idea. To maximize the storage, you need to have low connectivity. We think that's why it's even lower in the hippocampus than neocortex, because in hippocampus, the premium with a single net is on storing as many memories as possible. Okay. Now I'm going to go on a little bit to neocortex to consider some of the rules of wiring of the cortex. Now, cortical neurons, again, have large numbers of inputs, about 18,000 inputs. But there's a very peculiar asymmetry in the cortex of how all these inputs are connected up. So let's consider one cortical area, say primary visual cortex, feeding in a hierarchy up to the next cortical area, say V2. So this is forward connectivity, upper hierarchy. Now it turns out that superficial pyramidal cells, for example in layer three, are projecting forward, and the deeper ones tend to project back, but often up into layer one. So why would one have that asymmetry in the connectivity? Well, it turns out that in a hierarchy, it's very important that what is further up in the hierarchy is not reflected back into the earlier lower areas. For example, we discovered face cells at one time in the infrotemporal visual cortex. You don't find those at the start of the hierarchy in primary visual cortex. Now, everyone knows that. But if the connectivity were symmetrical, a strong backwards and forwards, then face cells at the top of the system would have to activate neurons down at the bottom. So for those of you who are doing functional connectivity and making models, I think it's crucial to understand that the model should really have the backward connectivity set to about a tenth of the value of the forward connectivity. So in most functional connectivity studies, one assumes that everything's symmetric. But actually, when you start to think about it and model it, that can't work. And so we've studied formal models of this, um, which specify how weak the top-down input has to be. And it has to be a tenth or less of the bottom-up input. So cortical connectivity is fundamentally asymmetric. And that's very important nowadays in terms of modeling the dynamics um, of cortical networks and how they would interact. OK, here's another fundamental rule of cortical connectivity. This is the hippocampus with its recurrent collateral systems. And it happens to receive RCA3 from large parts of the neocortex. 
And so these are the forward inputs coming down to the hippocampus. But it's no good storing a memory in the hippocampus unless you can retrieve it. So there are back projections. Here they are. These ones shown as dashed lines, which come back to bits of neocortex so that you can retrieve information back in neocortex. Now, it turns out that a fundamental property of cortical design is there are as many back projections, these dashed lines, as there are forward projections. Why? Again, genes have to specify this, but why would that be essential? Now, there is only one answer I've ever heard, and that's the following, that if you want to retrieve information, the number of memories you can retrieve depends on the number of connections on each neuron here. Um, so if you're going to bring down, say, 12,000 different memories to your hippocampus, to retrieve the 12,000, you have to have the same number of synapses on each neuron in the back projecting pathway as you do in the forward. And we produced a formal analysis of that at one time, which shows that the number of memories you can retrieve in the back projection pathway now depends on C, the number of connections on each back projecting neuron. So again, what I'm really trying to emphasize today is that one needs a detailed theory of the operation of individual networks to understand what has to be specified by genes and why. And the idea is the genes have better specify as many back projections as forward projections because it seems to be a fundamental rule of operation of neocortex. Now, I was saying that these back projections from, say, a bit of prefrontal cortex back to an earlier bit of cortex have to be weaker. And we can study that when we have two um, integrate and fire attractor networks and we connect them with forward connections and backward connections. And I've already said that the back projections have to be about a tenth of the value of the forward projections. But what I haven't said is what the value of both of these has to be relative to, to the internal recurrent collateral. And again, that's a fundamentally crucial parameter to set, it turns out. Now, just imagine with me that this is an attractor network, and so is this, but that these connections are fairly strong, and so are the back ones. Can you see that the architecture you've designed actually turns out now to be a single attractor network? That is, um, these neurons, when they start firing, activate these neurons, and these ones, when they start firing, activate those ones. Now, if the whole of your cerebral cortex was a single network, what would be its total storage capacity? It would be C, the number of connections on any one neuron, about 12,000 memories. So you see, neocortex has to operate fundamentally as separate local networks. This network has to be roughly independent of that one so that this can enter an attractor basin which can be separate from that one. And then you can store throughout the whole of your cortex many different things. Again, a fundamental rule, design rule of cortex, but to get it to work, it turns out then that these internal recurrent collaterals have to be about 10 to 50 times stronger than the forward and back projections. Again, a fundamental thing that has to be specified by genes. And again, this comes out of formal theoretical physics calculations on these systems. So the internal recurrent collaterals have to be much stronger than the forward and backward projections. That still helps top-down attention to work and memory recall but it means that then the local dynamics dominate. Okay, here's the last rule I'm going to talk about in connection with rules of operation. <clears throat> so the cerebral cortex has hierarchies for almost every sensory system. So here's primary visual cortex going to V2, going to V4, posterior infrotemporal, and anterior 
in some samples. As you traverse the hierarchy, the receptive fields here get bigger for single neurons. And by the end of the system, a single neuron can respond to an object, but it can respond independently of where the object is in visual space. And that's made possible by this sort of connectivity. This neuron connects to a small part of this region, any neuron here to a small part of the preceding region, and any neuron here to a small part of that preceding region. The consequence of that is that a neuron at the top layer can see over the whole of the first layer. But it has to do it in a four-stage uh, connectivity system because otherwise the number of synapses on one of these neurons here would have to be sufficient to cover the whole of this space, the whole of those neurons, which is millions and millions. So can you see that hierarchies in neocortex bias um, tremendous computing power for neurons that have a limited number of inputs? But again, to specify this architecture, it's very important to specify the region over which a single neuron here should receive its inputs. It's got to be over a small radius, not too large, not too small. And again, that is going to be a crucial parameter that genes will be setting. Okay, so the idea is that the parameters that have to be specified would include, for classes of network, um, <clears throat> effectively, which neuron you have to connect to. Imagine you're a CA3 neuron. What you have to know is you have to make 12,000 connections to other CA3 neurons. So, and you have to make about 9,000 connections to CA1 neurons. So there has to be a sort of specification whereby a neuron class, say CA3 versus CA1, knows which class it is, and knows how many connections to make to another class. The same for the mossy fibers. So each CA3 neuron has to know, I have to receive 48 inputs. So it looks as if the specification is going to be the, of the following sort. It looks as if each class of neuron, for example, CA3 or CA1, is going to have specified for it genetically the number of neurons in the class, for example, 300,000 in CA3, then it needs to have some parameters that determine how sensitive it is to its inputs, such as um, the threshold for firing and how sensitive it is to its inputs. So that's what we call intra-class specification. What I'm suggesting is there has to be for each class of neuron in each cortical area, a set of genes which are controlling this, how the cortex is built. And then between the classes of neuron, you need to specify, for example, the size of the connection region. That's our, in our hierarchy, the region of, from the preceding area over which you need input. You need to specify the number of excitatory or inhibitory inputs. You need to specify whether it's a linear or a nonlinear system. And then you need to set up the synaptic weights to be either low at the start or to have random values. Then you need to specify what synaptic modification rule to use and how fast it should alter. By synaptic modification rule, I might mean Hebbian plasticity. And the sort of synaptic modification rules, which we know are present in different bits of the brain, include things like Hebb rules, where the change of synaptic weight is proportional to the postsynaptic firing rate, and then something to do with R sub J, the presynaptic firing rate. But at some sites, there's no learning at all. And at many sites, we see slightly more complicated learning, including long-term depression. So it looks as if, again, that has to be specified for a particular connection between a class of neurons. That's the sort of thing that differs in different bits of the cortex. 
time. So what we did, and this was a paper that we did in 2000, was having guessed what the genes were specifying, we then set up a genetic algorithm with those guesses of what the genes were specifying and said, can you build computationally useful networks that have to solve different problems? In other words, there were different fitness functions. So we set up a genetic algorithm. There were 100 individuals in each generation. Um, <clears throat> and the genotypes are selected for reproduction with a probability that's proportional to their fitness. Now, what's the fitness? The fitness here is how well can you perform auto-association or pattern association or, in fact, competitive learning. So we had three different learning tasks that could be solved by one-layer networks. And then reproduction in these systems operates using two mathematical algorithms. One is crossover, which is very powerful for local hill climbing. And the other is a mutation, which enables you to make a big jump through the space. So if you imagine a search space like this, in which you're trying to find the highest hill, it turns out that just hill climbing won't suffice because you might get stuck at the top of this hill and never find this one. So what sexual reproduction enables you to do is to do the local hill climbing very efficiently. But it can get stuck. And so you have to have mutations as well, which enable you to jump randomly through the space. But you have to do that with a fairly low probability. So the mutations have to be set to about 100th of the value of the recombinations. So it turns out that sexual reproduction is a highly efficient way to solve these, this, these sorts of complex problems. So we let, then, sexual reproduction try and build one of these. Uh, don't worry too much about what it does. It basically associates a condition stimulus with an unconditioned stimulus. But this is the architecture of the net. And the task was to associate 10 pairs of random binary patterns, a pattern here and a pattern here, with a sparseness which had 0.5. Half the neurons were on and half were off. And what the system did is shown here. This is the generation number. And this is how well the system does, as shown by the solid line. So over 10 generations, it learned to solve the pattern association problem quite well. But what it did was it selected different parameters that were being specified. And in fact, the crucial parameter it chose was C equals 90. So that's 90 connections onto each neuron out of 100 possible. So basically, the genetic algorithm had discovered that to solve a memory problem, it had to select a large number of connections per neuron, and it had to select an appropriate Hebbian learning mean. Now, if we set it an auto-association problem, that is just do a short-term memory task, it was able to learn that. And if we set it a competitive or categorization task, take a set of vectors here, and learn which neurons to activate for each vector. It could learn that too. So what does that show us? What it shows us is that this sort of specification, the rules that we guessed by looking around different cortical areas, was adequate to specify the architecture and functioning of different types of one-layer cortical networks. So obviously, the details of what the genes are going to be specifying will not be exactly what we've guessed. But I've tried to give you an idea for how to build a computational device in bits of cortex. The genes must be selecting somehow certain sorts of things. And in a sense, when one's searching now for interesting genes, those might be the sort of things to look for. And I think there's an even more important point. Um, yeah, let's just go back. So. In a sense, given that we have genes for each class of neurons, we should be looking for genes that, say, specify CA3 connectivity or CA1 connectivity, not necessarily general genes. So say I want to treat depression or something like that. I ought to try to find out 
which genes are specifying the connectivity of, say, pregenual cingulate cortex. And then I should be targeting my search for drugs or for modulators, at those particular things. In other words, aiming, I'm suggesting, for particular circuits. And do we know that's feasible? Well, Tonegawa was, was able to produce, for example, a CA3 to CA3 connection knockout for the NMDA receptors. So that tells us there are genes that are specifying connections between particular classes. He was also able to do a knockout of CA3 to CA1 NMDA receptors. Again, telling us that the idea presented here does seem to be feasible. So that, in a way, is trying to suggest a new paradigm for trying to understand cortical connectivity and how to influence it. So look for genes not that are generally affecting activity over the whole brain, but which are building the networks in particular parts of the brain. Okay, so, so that was, as it were, the difficult bit, the theoretical neuroscience bit. Now I want to turn back to what the implications might be of this sort of understanding of connectivity for disorders of the operation of these cortical networks. So of all the parameters I've talked about, how are they going to upset the system? How might we account, in this case, for something like schizophrenia? So let's take a simple attractor network and notice that these excitatory synapses, the recurrent collaterals, for example, suffer in schizophrenia from hypoglutamatergia or something which does the same, decreased D1 receptor activation, which downregulates the glutamate system, or a decreased number of spines on pyramidal cells, happening, of course, at the time of adolescence. Now, what would be the consequence for, of, of that in this attractor network? Notice that then the total excitation summed up on the dendrite entering one of these neurons will go down. With fewer spines, there's less current here. The firing rates, you would think, would go down. So if the firing rates are lower, What's the consequence of that in a short-term memory network of this even 5% down regulation? Well, it turns out that if the positive feedback doesn't keep the firing rates up high enough, the system is unstable and it's likely to be knocked out of the high firing rate short-term memory or, or attention state by the noise in the system. So let me see if I can show you that. I'm going to show you a simulation now in which we have either spontaneous activity. Now, the important thing about spontaneous activity is if there's no input, it should remain at the low firing rate spontaneous state. It shouldn't jump up into a high firing rate short-term memory state. Otherwise, that would be spurious, abnormal, and might correspond to a positive symptom, schizophrenia. Then, if we present a stimulus, and then remove the stimulus after half a second, the system should keep firing to maintain that in short-term memory. Now let's have a look at whether that system works. So this is the same simulation I showed you before. Integrate and fire. Here's the firing rate of the neurons. And in the top, we have the system working properly. So in this case, we provide an input. We provide it to this network to this set of neurons, and their firing rate goes up, and it stays up for the whole three seconds. So that's stable short-term memory. If we don't provide an input to the neurons, then it stays down in the low state. So that's correct and not pathological. But now let's look at the other two things that can happen. Here I start off this set of neurons, and it goes up to a high firing rate state, goes along, but in the end, it drops out of its high firing rate state. So that's pathological. That's a failure of working memory or of attention. In contrast, if the system's supposed to stay down, but the noise makes it jump up, which it does here, then that's incorrect performance and could 
correspond to something coming into your memory with no input, a bit like a positive symptom. So these are the two faulty states. So what we did is we measured whether the system behaved like this correctly or whether these two types of error occurred. And let me say, I think there's something that's not quite intuitive here, but is incredibly important. When the system is up and firing, you have to have enough excitation to keep it up. So excitation is important. But the other condition for stability is to have enough inhibition so that you keep the system down when it shouldn't be jumping up. That is when there's no input. In other words, to maintain stability, you've got to have a lot of excitation in the right place and a lot of inhibition simultaneously. They don't cancel out. That's the fundamental point in these attractor networks, which are the fundamental design feature of neurocortex. So now let's have a look at how the stability of this system was affected, for example, by decreasing the NMDA conductances just by 5%. So what happens is, instead of staying up at the high firing rate states, the system dropped out. So on 60% of the occasions, the firing wasn't maintained. It's not surprising. If you decrease the excitation in the system, the firing rates aren't high enough, not enough positive feedback, so it drops out. But remember, that's what Coyle and many others have found in the brains of schizophrenics. If we alter the GABA, and this is the black one, by about 5%, then we see that the opposite happens. It's now the spontaneous state that's not stable. And again, not too surprising. If you don't have enough GABA, then the spontaneous state will tend to jump up into the high firing rate state. And that's what that indicates. Now, if we alter both of them simultaneously, so if we decrease the GABA, then the system, instead of staying in its spontaneous state, often jumps up. And for example, here and here. This is one of the populations. This is the other population. But because of the noise in the system, because they're never firing very fast, if we decrease the NMDA conductance too, then neither of these attractor states is stable. So the system wanders around, first one population of cells firing, then stopping, then starting up again, then the other population starting up, and so on. So it wanders noisily through a space because, in this case, both the excitation is insufficient and so is the inhibition. So here we are, back to our firing rate figure, time in seconds, the green here tells us too little glutamate, or NMDA, causes the high firing rate states, these, to be unstable. In red, I'm saying too little GABA causes these low firing rates to be unstable. So what would be the consequences of that for schizophrenia? Let's now think of the cognitive symptoms. Say, in bits of prefrontal cortex, where we implement short-term memory and attention, they become less stable because the NMDA are down. The consequence would be that you would have poor working memory, distractibility, fa failure to maintain attention. So if this happened in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, you would get cognitive symptoms. If exactly the same happened, hypoglutamatergia, or decreased D1 activation. But now in the orbitofrontal cortex and pregenual, where we see you represent mood, pleasure, then the decreased firing rate would produce reduced emotion and reduced motivation. That is, I've shown you that the activations in your orbitofrontal cortex are linearly related to how pleasant, for example, the stimulus is. So all of that would be downgraded just by the NMDA receptor reduction or hypoglutamatergia occurring in your orbitofrontal cortex. Now let's consider the same happening in the temporal lobe, for example, in the hippocampus. That would have the same effect, that you wouldn't hold short-term memory as well in hippocampus 
But it turns out that there's reduced GABA inhibition too in the neocortex and in the hippocampus. And that can also result from reduced D1 receptor activation or arising because of reduced NMDA drive to the inhibitory interneuron. So what's the consequence of that going to be? It's going to be that attractor networks in the temporal lobe used for long-term memory are going to be jumping up into high firing rate states. You're going to have ideas coming into your mind, hallucinations, and so on. So the idea is that one can explain the positive symptoms of schizophrenia in the appropriate part of the brain by the instability caused by too little GABA. So now I want to consider what the implications of this are. If genes specify a reduced number of synapses on cortical pyramidal cells during adolescence, this could produce the cognitive and negative symptoms. If genetic differences between individuals lead to any downregulation of the glutamate NMDA system during adolescence, um, it could produce the sort of negative and cognitive symptoms. Any gene influence, GABA down regulation, um, could produce the positive symptoms. Now, there may be advantages in having networks that are unstable. I've already hinted at that, that creativity and unpredictability can be useful. And that may be, therefore, the some selection pressure to maintain some instability in the population. So that could be why um, schizophrenia hasn't disappeared totally from the population. Uh, having a little bit of that gene could be helpful for creativity and so on. So at least some neuropsychiatric states, schizophrenia and OCD, which we've argued is the opposite, may be related not to aberrant wiring, but to relatively minor, about 5%, quantitative changes in, for example, the number of spines on dendrites or the amount of transmitter release. So you see, that's again what I'm saying genes should be specifying. But I'm saying the whole circuit doesn't have to be wrong. It could just be that the parameters in the circuit, if they're slightly <coughs> misregulated by genes, could give rise to very serious abnormalities in cortex. So this is, I think, the take-home message of my talk, which I've shown in red. So a name might be given the genetic specification of the connectivity and rules of operation of each network in the brain to target genes that are specific for setting the parameters in the connectivity of each network. So let's go after, for example, singular connectivity. Let's go after hippocampal connectivity. Let's go after dorsolateral connectivity, find the genes that specify that, and then see if there are ways for much more specifically influencing things like psychiatric disorders. So I'm suggesting that that might be an alternative strategy, given what I've said. Um, and I think that's actually where I'm going to stop. Um, so thank you very much. We're running late, but I think that was such a um, dense and thoughtful talk that let's let's take five minutes because I'm sure someone will have some questions. Kevin, I think it's uh, fascinating work that you just gave, uh, but there's also a question of robustness that arises for me. So mm -hmm. there are many many assumptions in the models. And I'm, I'm thinking in particular of the genetic uh, model, mm -hmm. where you could say these assumptions aren't exactly right, and that's mm -hmm. fine. We can't, we can't, of course, be exactly right now. But in, in some places, the spirit of the model seems a little different from the underlying biology. Mm -hmm. So you have a single parameter for the topology of the network. And I think a developmental biologist might think a lot in terms of mechanisms like axon guidance that aren't directly represented in the model. So how do you know that you've got the right model or at least a close enough model? Right. OK. So um, <clears throat> you're quite right. Uh, what we did in setting up that model was, if anything, we simplified the way in which the genes might have to specify something. So what we chose were parameters that are crucial to the architectural design that has to be reached, 
and we set those sometimes as parameters. Although, of course, the actual ways in which the genes would achieve those values could be quite different. So you're quite right. Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, fabulous talk, really thought-provoking, and, and uh, I think, for me, I'm certainly thinking thoughts I haven't thought before, so thank you for that. Um, I, I guess I, I would second what Gary had said about the idea, well, first of all, it's a really interesting idea for a developmental neurobiologist to consider the fact that they, you know, if you're thinking about synapse specification, we tend to think of just having genes that specify what, which cell type uh, synapses with o which other cell type and don't spend as much time, if any, thinking on how you specify the number of connections or the weight from one area to another. Um, so, so I think that's really interesting and, and although I, I also think that the ways that the logic of the genetic program will achieve that is probably uh, different from, it's not going to specify it in the direct way, it's going to, you know, specify things like how big of a dendritic tree do you make? How many spines, how many neurons you make over here, how many axons you guide in, and, and so on. Um, but I think one of the interesting things here is this, uh, the idea that you get this relatively minor quantitative change in, in, in uh, subtle parameters in a network that can cause that dysfunction because of the, the recurrent uh, network, you know, architecture and attractor networks and so on, which may represent an answer to a question that kind of constantly bugs me, which is why mutations in so many different genes can lead to conditions like schizophrenia and why so many of them are dosage sensitive where they actually only you only need a single mu copy of the mutation um, and why the system should be so so sensitive and I think that may be an answer to it because the the you know every time you cause a mutation that changes the synapse type a little bit you're amplifying it by 18,000 across all the number of cells in, in, in the network and, and changing it like that so um, I think that might be a really interesting key point for all of us to keep yeah. in mind. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. And thank you very much for picking up that that's exactly what I was trying to do. I was trying to you know, draw on the experience of having worked on lots of bits of the brain and modeled many of them to then try and generalize between them as to what's been specified. So I'm glad it stimulated that sort of thought. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, on the stability issue, um, the sort of thing that Anne works on, the basal ganglia, is incredibly simple, you see, as a machine, because it's got direct inhibition between the neurons, the safest thing you can do. Nothing's going to go wrong. So the big problem with the architecture I've been talking about, cerebral cortex, is that it's positive feedback. The recurrent collaterals are excitatory, and we buy a lot with them, such as short-term memory and therefore planning, therefore long-term episodic memory, the ability to retrieve a whole pattern from parts, and so on nice decision-making mechanism, but it's incredibly dangerous. And so your point that quite a number of genes might destabilize it is absolutely, I think, appropriate. <coughs> quite wonderful talk, thank you so much. Uh, I was especially taken by the extrapolation of the, the low D1 states from DLPFC and the effects of that and what it might have if you found it in pregenual singular. But I wonder if, if the analogy holds because if you had low D1 states in pregenual singular, what you would see was not a, a, a change in the max amplitude of an emotion, but in the maintenance of that particular affective state. What you would predict is actually affective instability, which is not primarily what you see in mood disorders. And in fact, you might suggest actually it would be a high D1 state, you know, representing perseveration and inflexibility rather than a low D1 state in pregenual singular that, that might be linked to, to dysphoria and mood disorders. Okay. Um, <coughs> the, do the D1 receptors come into it particularly for schizophrenia, and the idea is to show that they have effects on glutamate systems. So um, <coughs> the way I would interpret that for anterior cingulate would be a low D1 state would downregulate glutamate, and that would decrease firing rates in that region. But, okay. Just on that topic, I think it, you can... It, it brings up a point that you can oversimplify because if you have a push me, pull you state with low glutamate, actually you've got to consider the GABA state. And I would argue that actually in pregenual versus subgenual or you know subcolossal that you get into a bind where they're actually fighting with each other. So I think you could reconcile actually both of them um, 
and model it to explain. Um, uh, and if I can just comment on that, I mean, <coughs> it's exactly right that, of course, one of the major inputs to the GAB in neurons comes from the excitatory pyramidal cells. But then, at least in relation to schizophrenia, there's something that helps to break that symmetry. Um, it's the decreased number of spines. So that could be a secondary consequence to GABA alterations, I suppose. But it sounds more likely that the decreased number of spines at adolescence on pyramidal cells might be a primary driver.